Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker books on writing, and Renee Gutteridge, best-selling author of over 30 novels and screenplays. Hello, writers. Welcome, or welcome back, to the first official episode of the second season, the rebranded podcast. You may have noticed some changes already, the main one being that we're calling it WriterCon. Well, don't unsubscribe because you don't think this will be like the podcast you've been listening to in the past. It totally is. Same podcast, new name. As you probably know, you certainly know if you've listened to this podcast for very long, that uh, for years, some friends of mine and I have hosted a writer's conference in Oklahoma City called WriterCon, which takes place in Oklahoma City every Labor Day weekend, which, by the way, is September 2nd to September 5th this year. Anyway, that WriterCon brand has taken off, and now we're using it for cruises and retreats and all kinds of things, so it just makes sense to relabel the podcast writer con and if you're pondering but the con stands for a, a, a conference or a convention that doesn't really work here here's where you you may have been mistaken because at least in this podcast the con stands for conclave and that's what this podcast is going to be like a private meeting for aspiring writers and other experienced writers and published and others in the publishing world. And this change also gives me an excuse to introduce uh, to the podcast one of my writer con partners, a best-selling author and screenplay writer, and one of my favorite people on earth, Renee Gutteridge. Renee, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate being invited and um Hopefully, I can contribute some good things. We'll see. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I'm certain. I'll, uh, well, I'll raise some good questions, at least, and uh, <laughs> we'll have some fun. But yeah, I'm super glad to be here. You obviously, being a co-host of WriterCon, are going to be at WriterCon this year, which, as we speak, is about a month away, not too late to register not at all. We need you guys to get on there and get registered. So uh, yeah. we're yeah. excited to have you. We've got a lot of people registered already, which we're already super excited about. Do we still have hotel uh, spaces? We do, right? Space, yes. Yes. Yeah. So we've at been at some point. The, uh, about us, but. At some point, the discount you get if you're with the conference will run out. Yeah. I don't know so when exactly. Time. But yep, I know it's there's still rooms. It. So what are you looking forward to most at WriterCon this year, Renee? Well, I mean, a lot. But I think the best part about WriterCon is the community we built and uh, the great speakers that we bring in. So it's always fun to see old faces and meet new faces and um, learn new things. So it's uh, it's really the highlight of my year. <laughs> I mean, writers like <laughs> to hang around feel. writers. Yeah, yeah. It, oh, it really they is. do, but we have so few opportunities because we're all mm -hmm. at home typing. Yes, or we're in, in the case, writer's in, cave. Yeah, in your case, some coffee shop typing, probably. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> Jesse, you're going to be at WriterCon too. A repeat attendee. Uh, what are you looking forward to most? Well, I'm looking forward to not both having a like my own panel where it's only me talking about podcasting on top of preparing for a live podcast. And just this time I'm just going to be around talking to people. And then at some point we might do a radio, like a, a gorilla radio podcast set up <laughs> at some point. Um, I'm, I'm just excited to get people's feedback and um, being with creative people who are with other creative people is always very energetic. And yeah. as a creative yeah, person yeah. in a very different field, uh, it's, and as someone who loves reading, I love hanging out with authors. So it's it's fun for me all around. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We will undoubtedly talk more about WriterCon. The website is writercon.com. 
W-R-I-T-E-R-C-O-N dot C-O-M, and it is not too late to register. So to launch season two of the podcast, we wanted obviously a big name, and they don't come any bigger than Dean Koontz. I've been a fan of this superstar, best-selling author for years, and he is still topping the charts. He's got a new novel called The Big Dark Sky that I think is one of his best ever. He's a skilled writer and artist, but he encountered some controversy a few years ago when he left The Big Five to publish with Amazon Publishing. I'm going to be asking him about that and much more. Let me just give you this proviso up front because of Mr. Kuntz's schedule. We recorded this interview in advance, which is why it may seem like I suddenly changed my shirt for no reason or <laughs> Renee just disappeared or whatever. But the point of this is at one point, he's a, a, a few years ago, uh, Dean Kuntz and I were co-keynotes at this thing called Men of Mystery. Now, in what universe anybody thinks that we are parallel players, I don't, but whatever, just lean back and enjoy it, right? <laughs> so the two big shots supposedly were Dean Koontz and me, and we both spoke, and I'm uh, embarrassed to admit that I also even kind of played the piano and sang and I'm only mentioning this because he, as you're about to hear, like 10 years later, still remembers that. All right. Anyway, we'll get to that interview later on. But first, the news. Clearly, the biggest story in the book world today is the ongoing congressional investigation into whether one Big Five publisher should be allowed to acquire another, basically making the Big Five the Big Four, because, of course, it's Penguin Random House, which is itself a merger that's only a few years old, whether they can now buy Simon & Schuster. Oh, well, would that diminish competition? As some people believe, it would it violate antitrust laws. You can see in the graphic, Stephen King testified that it would be bad for writers. Uh, and uh, other people have as well. Renee, what do you think? Bad for writers? Merger good? Merger bad? Does it matter? Well, okay. Let me begin this by explaining that... I was an A student and did very well in college, but almost flunked beginning economics. So <laughs> you can take this with a grain of salt with <laughs> the wisdom that I'll share. And I would say it's only conventional wisdom at best. Um, I would say any, any time red flags fly, any time mm -hmm. large companies get larger, um, power is shifted and those types of things it's never good uh, mm -hmm. we've seen that and that's why uh things are getting dicey here um i think when big and powerful writers begin to speak up that's always a good thing um mm -hmm. and you know it it trickles down in different ways what is bad for a best-selling author might not be that bad for a mid-list. Exactly. Um, that yeah. was my problem with them picking Stephen King. I mean, I can see why they did. He's a familiar face and big name, but he operates on a completely different level, really in a whole different world. At this point, I would say there are maybe 20 to 30 so-called legacy authors, people who were huge before the <laughs> the the change that ebooks brought but still are anyway the point is the legacy authors make their money off advances and their advances are going to be bigger if they can get bidding auctions and so the more the merrier but that's a completely different world than what most people are living in yeah yeah that's that that's my you know that would be 
my best guess at this is most of us being middle listers or at one time had a bestseller or two, whatever the case, uh, these these types of things don't necessarily hit us immediately. It may trickle down in a way that is slow and uh, hard to detect, um, which is why I often um, relied heavily on my my agent um, yeah, in negotiating course. these things because I, you know, like I said, I'm I'm heavily right brained. <laughs> uh, don't think economically in anything in my life. So uh, trying to navigate something like this on my own is absolutely impossible. Um, yeah. So I would, and, and through the years, you know, like uh, one of my publishers has been acquired, I don't know how many times, I'm not even sure where I am anymore. I know by the, the uh, you know, some of the mail I get with who owns what at this point, but um, you know, these are, these are things that, um, I hope that they at higher levels can, uh, work out for the betterment of 90% of the authors, which are mid-listers. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, well, right. <laughs> some people would say the mid-list doesn't even exist anymore, but at any rate, not in that 20 to 30 person list of, uh, of a major, you know, yes. uh, legacy author. So, Cara, one of the things that's really bothered me about this whole thing, and you see that uh, we're using a New York Times article. Well, okay, New York supports New York. I get that. But <laughs> all of these analysts and articles seem to act as if Big Five Publishing is it. You know, that's the whole right. consideration. And, of course, that's not it. And it hasn't been it for a long time. We know yeah. they are giving up market share to smaller, pre which is not necessarily small, but smaller presses and regional presses. And of course, yep. the self-publishing uh, wave is now said, at least by some sources, to put more dollar bills in the pockets of authors than traditional publishing. Not to say you can't go either way, uh, you know, that's a long discussion, but the point is these things are not insignificant and all this coverage completely ignores it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that they are starting to, uh, at least the people who are crunching numbers are starting to realize they shouldn't ignore it um, yeah. because the wave and the number of people, uh, writers who have caught, <laughs> caught the wave um, mm -hmm. for other options is enormous and it is shifting uh, the way things are done and, and where the money goes, right? All right. Well, totally. Absolutely. And hold that thought because news item number two, <laughs> how's that for a segue? Jesse on the, Very nice. the Very nice. yeah, oh, thank you. Okay. If he says good, yeah. it's good. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of alternative ways of getting published, <laughs> this story <laughs> involves a TikTok sensation who scored a book deal with Barnes & Noble's publishing arm. Uh, this is a self-published author. Her name is Melissa Blair. She sold the rights to her YA young adult fantasy series to Union Square, which is a Barnes & Noble press. And uh, what's even, you know, we all love these success stories where people come from non-traditional uh, origins, in this case, self-publishing movement. But uh, I, I particularly thought what she said was interesting. She she talks about how'd she get to this point, and her explanation was basically with self-publishing she built. And here's where we expect her to say an author platform, because that's what they talk about at conferences, even ours, <laughs> building your author platform. But what she said was that she was building a community. And of course, that's a perfect fit with TikTok. We all know BookTok is a thriving community, which has led to a big uptick in book sales for many, many authors. Uh, now, Renee, I think I remember you telling me that you are actually a TikTok user, aren't you? Bill, I <laughs> have no idea how to use TikTok. I, no, I, I tried to get, I, uh, no, I mean, I watch TikTok videos in, ha in when they filter into Instagram somehow. Um, <laughs> but no, like I've had to like cut, cut.
cut off my social media at some point, and I think it was at TikTok. Um, although I will tell you, I could get very addicted to it. I uh, just knowing mm-hmm. how addicted I am already to Instagram. So, uh, but I I do want to say that I think she's she's spot on when she talks about community. I think that's the shift that we're seeing that the author platform. Um, and I don't think it's a big shift. I think platform was always meant to mm-hmm. build community, but yes. through social media now and places like TikTok, um, community is being built in a different way, especially with the younger um, crowd. And I think we need you know, to pay attention to how they're doing it. I think uh, they're doing it well. I would say they're doing it well, mm-hmm. and I, yeah. I love watching it. Figured out something that works. Do yeah. either of you, Jesse? Do you go to TikTok or Book Talk? Uh, no, I'm I'm kind of like Renee. Like when the TikTok videos filter onto Facebook or Instagram, I see them. I do occasionally open TikTok and go through it, but it's such a time suck that I try not <laughs> to do it. Um, I will say though, since we're talking about WriterCon, um, my same argument for why authors should have podcasts is the same reason she gave, which is that it builds a community around mm-hmm. you and your work outside of the work itself. So mm-hmm. it, whether it's yeah. TikTok, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a blog, like building a connection with your audience, even before you have something to sell is worthwhile. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and people are gonna... looking for community. Yeah. You know, yeah. they really are. Like, I think in this day and age, especially during COVID, right? I mean, we're still, I feel like in COVID, even though we're not in COVID, like we're still, <laughs> we haven't left isolation in a sense. Um, I think community is something that is more needed now than ever. So we should use that to our benefit. My interview today is with Dean Kuntz, superstar author of Watchers and the Odd Thomas series and many, many other fine novels. We had a great conversation. Here is what we said. Dean Kuntz, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me there. Oh, thank you so much for being here. All right, same traditional first question. If you could give an aspiring writer or any kind of writer one piece of advice, one, what would it be? Well, there's so many ways you can go wrong in your career that, uh, and I've gone wrong in most of them and had to repair things. But I think if there was one thing I would say, it would be, you're going to hear a lot of publishing wisdom. It's all common wisdom. It's not real wisdom. And nobody actually knows anything any more than they do in the uh, film business. So uh, take your own counsel. Listen, when you hear something that sounds right, accept it, but don't believe everything you, you're told about what is possible and what isn't. Mm. Oh, that's terrific advice and almost makes me want to make sure I don't give any advice for the rest of this <laughs> much cast or however long, but that's absolutely. I'm t- telling what publishers tell you and editors sometimes. Uh, you can learn from other writers, I think. I certainly did. But, uh, but all that business stuff that they tell you what is possible and isn't and how things can be done and can't. Uh, most of it turns out not to be that written in the stone. Right. And if they if, if they were sure what was going to work, they wouldn't publish all those books that tank every month. So yes. <laughs> but clearly nobody can predict the future. Hey, let's talk about your new book, Just Out, The Big Dark Sky, which, just to brag a little on you, Booklist has already given it a starred review calls it, and I quote, another A-plus thriller from a writer on a serious winning streak. You've been writing for a while. It must be nice to hear that you're on a winning streak. (laughs) (laughs) Finally, after, I don't know, 50 or 100 books, you're finally on the streak. Well, it's nice that somebody responds to it well, because you're always going to get some of them. And it's another thing I tell young writers, you know, it's fine to read your reviews, but don't take any of it too seriously. Because if you take the good ones and say, that's absolutely right, then you can't, in all honesty, take the bad ones and say, that's absolutely wrong. Uh, you're going to have to uh, listen to both. And, 
And you don't want to listen to too many voices. You want to listen to the one in your own heart more than anything else. Yes, absolutely. Well, learning to take criticism is part of the job, I think. Yeah. But anyway, tell us about the big dark sky. Well, I think it's been 40 years. I wanted to write a novel about synchronicity, uh, what Jung called synchronicity, those coincidences in life that are so astonishing that they don't become, they aren't actually coincidences. They're revelation of some kind of structure to the world that we can't understand. This actually, I knew many years ago, ties to what quantum mechanics tells us as well. But I didn't know how to tell a story that was about astonishing coincidences that wouldn't seem like it was structured coincidental mm. and that readers would revolt from that. It took me like 40 years. And, uh, and then one day I thought, ah, I've got it. And that was the moment I knew I had to write it because I've never waited that long to write on any other subject. Uh, in this book, uh, there, it's subtle the way coincidences whip through the book, the way we're shown in quantum mechanics that everything in the universe is linked to everything else. Um, but it nevertheless explores that synchronicity. It also deals with uh, some real world synchronicity. It's one of the most famous. It was a church in Oklahoma. I think it was called the West Side Baptist Church back in the 50s. And they had choir practice every Sunday night for many years. And 15 people showed up for that every Sunday and no one had ever been late. Uh, and then one Sunday, everybody was late, all 15 of them, each for a different reason, for a car breakdown, for a fa sudden family illness, for one thing or another. And none of them showed up on time. Not only one of them was close to showing up on time, and arrived in the street just as this church blew up from a gas explosion. Mm -hmm. If all of them had been in the church, all of them would have been dead. Those kind of things have fascinated me for a long time. And this novel really gets into that uh, and goes forward uh, with that premise that synchronicity is underlying everything. Hmm. Sounds fascinating. Uh, so am I right in thinking this is a it's not part of any series. This is a standalone novel. You know, I've, I've, I've been saying at my age, you don't start series. <laughs> so, yes, this is a standalone. But you have done series characters. You've done oh, yes. uh, Odd Thomas and others. Which do you prefer? You like the, the series books or the standalones or neither? <laughs> I once said I would never do series. And I did Odd Thomas and Frankenstein and the Jane Hawk series. Uh, and it really, I've discovered, depends, and I think you must know this too, your Ben Kincaid, or so, I think probably from what I can see of the books and what I know of them, I would look at him and say, as a writer, you were captivated by the character, and that's why you wanted to write the series. And it took me a while to be captivated by one character to the extent that I thought, ah, oh, I have to follow this person through more books. Uh, so I gave up my pledge never to write a series and wrote two or three different ones. Uh, I, I like both the standalones and the series. Uh, uh, there's certain, uh, certain things about each one that make them attractive. Uh, and the character, being able to explore a character and develop them through more books is very enticing. Uh, and then some books... You think by that time I got it done, I like this book. I like the way it came out. But I've said what I have to say about this set of characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed, uh, at least up to a point, coming back to a character. Because even though I may think I know all about this person, it turns out I don't. <laughs> which, which seems true to life. You put somebody in a different situation and things change. And that's what happens in each new book, right? The circumstances change and the character has to adapt. Yeah, and in the case of Odd Thomas, I knew in the first book that I wanted to write more about this character. And I knew the key about him was that he was on a journey to absolute ability. And that was going to take enough, a number of books. Now, I thought, I don't think I'll ever know what absolute humility is like. So that's going to be the challenge. Uh, but in the end, I think we got him there. And that was greatly satisfying. I know Odd Thomas has been incredibly successful for you. And 
I think at least according to something I read online, <laughs> Thomas, maybe your best-selling book, what do you, the first one, I mean, what, what do you think is the appeal of the character? Um, I think it is his humility, his sense of humor, uh, and the kind of quirky way he looks at the world. He's got a kind of uh, cockeyed feel. He's also totally capable of taking care of himself, uh, but he doesn't walk around with big guns and, and uh, chain mail. He, uh, he uses whatever weapon at hand like a broom or a, or something else. And he's uh, uh, just different. I remember when I delivered the first novel, my publisher at that time was so upset with it that he wouldn't talk to me about it. The only time that ever happened. Then the uh, bookseller reaction and advance orders started coming in. And the advance reviews started coming in. Hmm. And he said to me, uh, look, I know you want to write more about this character, and I'm going to have to let you do it, but <laughs> let you have to deliver a standalone between each in the series. And hmm. I said, okay. Uh, and I think eventually he got the character. But I think Odd Thomas's nature was something he hadn't seen before and yeah. didn't think would work. Um, and so it was, uh, it was fun. We got an almost excellent movie out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Sommers wrote a brilliant script, raised money to make it by selling off foreign territories. And then halfway through the movie, his budget disappeared on him. We won't go into how that happened. And uh, he had to cut dramatically what, how he put together his script and what he could film. And it didn't turn out like it should have, but it was still something I could watch. And I can't yeah. say that's always been the case. Wow, interesting and charitable review. <laughs> Let's talk about you a little bit. How'd you get started with uh, the writing? Is this what you always wanted to do even when you were young or did it come later? I, I would say, Apparently, it was unconscious, the desire, because by the time I was eight, I was writing little stories on tablet paper and drawing covers and stapling the edge and putting electrician tape over the staples and trying to peddle these to relatives for a nickel. <laughs> so I was a writer, publisher, agent, uh, editor. Um, and I don't know why, because there weren't books in our house uh, and books were considered to be of no value. It was, however, around the time I got nine or 10 that I started uh, being a heavy, very heavy reader. Um, and then when I was in college, my, it was, I guess, at the end of my junior year, a professor had submitted a story I wrote uh, for class. It was submitted to the Atlantic Monthly College Writing Competition, and it won a fiction prize. That made me a big dog in that small teacher's <laughs> college. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I was a slacker kind of student and just wanted to get through this so I could get a teaching job. And the greatest thing to me about that board, there was no money that came with it, but they had been submitting teachers at that college forever and nobody had ever placed in the competition. Right. So after that, I never had to do anything. And I got straight A's. And I said, this is cool. Uh, that's the point. I started to think maybe there's a life in this. And then I sold that same story to a little magazine for $50, which in those days was more than now. Still wasn't much, but paperbacks were 60 cents. Uh, so I could buy a lot of paperbacks. And it was with that that I began to think, hmm, this is not only something I like to do, it might be something that I can do to make a living. Took a while, but uh, took a long while, in fact, but it did happen. Right. Well, it turned out pretty well. When was your first book published? 1968, I think. It was one half of an ace science fiction double. You would get <laughs> two novels with two different covers when you turned the book over. This right. like that. Oh, that's fantastic. I didn't realize that. Yeah. It, uh, the publisher told me. Now, we normally pay $1,500, but your novel is short, so we're only going to pay you $1,250 because we're going to have to pay the novelist on the other side an extra $250. And I was just so excited about being published. I had grabbed it. Right. And years passed. I got the book 
pretty quickly because they published, I think, within eight or nine months. And I, I looked and looked, and it seemed to me the novels were about equal length. And years later, I was at some writer's convention, and I ran into the writer who was on the other side. And I said, oh, my first novel was on the other side of one of yours. And he said, yes, I know. Because of you, I had to accept less money. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, they paid me twelve fifty because your novel was longer. And I thought, how interesting. Uh, that was my first lesson in business to publish. Yeah, welcome to publishing, for sure. <laughs> That's a nice way to get started. And obviously, it's been going ever since. I know that there's a lot of science in your books, or just enough, some people might say, but... Uh, and other things that make me think, uh, yeah, he looked into that. He did his research. How do you do research these days? I'm very old. I do not go online. Partly that's because I, uh, I, I know my nature. I'm an obsessive. And once I go online, I'll be online and nothing else. So I still do most of my research the old-fashioned way through books, through calling people in certain fields that uh, have told me they're willing to share their knowledge with me. And then when I want something I can't find, and I know it's online, I ask my assistant, Linda, to find it for me. She goes and finds it and prints it out. But uh, it's interesting to me, when I was in college, I hated research. And I used to just make it up when I was <laughs> writing a report. I never got caught. I would cite books that didn't exist at the source. Um, and then, uh, and once I got into writing, research became one of the things I liked the most. Uh, and I guess it was simply because I'm now research, researching things that truly interest me. Yeah. Well, if you're going to put it in a book, it must interest you and therefore mm -hmm. will interest somebody else as well. Can you talk a little bit about your writing process? I mean, you clearly have it down. It seems to work for you, whatever you do. Uh, take us through the stages. So. Uh, the big dark sky, and you've got this idea. Where do you go from there? Well, once I have a premise, and I don't have a plot, but a premise. Uh, and in this case, uh, I knew that the way this was going to open was a woman who's 34 years old. And when she was seven, eight, nine, living on a ranch in Montana, she, excuse me, had a, let's say, a secret friend. And, she, and it was very important in her life uh, who this secret friend was. But she's totally forgotten it. And uh, suddenly she begins to get messages from the ranch in Montana by phone, by other means, saying, Jojo, I'm in a dark place. Please come help me. And they're coming from this secret friend uh, that she has totally forgotten. That was the little premise. Who is that? And what does it say about why she forgot? And about the past never really is the past. It's always there in the present. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of little premise I start with. I don't outline. You know, when I got into this, uh, I outlined because I could sell the books after a while with an outline. They'd pay me half. I'd write the book, they'd pay me the other half. Um, and it was just holding me back in a way. And it was holding me back because the books were never what the outline was precisely. Right. I'd start writing them. The books went somewhere else that was more interesting. And yet when I delivered it, I again and again had the publisher say, this isn't quite what we bought. And they were always a little disappointed because they had a year or whatever to think about what they had bought. And here it was, but not really. And I felt that they were, they were not seeing that the book I wrote was actually better than the outline would have yeah. been if I stayed true to it. So the first book I did with no outline, Strangers, and it was a, over a quarter of a million words, multiple plot lines. Uh, and I just had the best time. I just let the characters take over and I let it go. And, uh, and that turned out to be the first hardcover bestseller I had. And after that, I've stopped plotting altogether. I begin with the premise, a character or two I think I'm going to find really interesting. And then sort of, I say to young writers, I give the character free will. Mm -hmm. uh, and they say, 
that how's that possible? Because you're creating a character. But I think you would know that it's having what I do. They take you places you don't anticipate. Right. And you better go with them when they do, uh, because it's some secret wisdom below your conscious level. And it's always going to be a little smarter, I think, than the things you cook up on a conscious level. Right. Okay, that sounds great. But here would be my concern. So you're letting the characters have free will. You're making things exciting and uh, mysterious. But at some point, you got to explain all this Mm -hmm. (laughs) and wrap it up. And I'm concerned. I and what'd you say? A quarter of a million words. I'd get to the end of that and have no idea how to end it. Doesn't happen to you, I guess. Now, to be fair, sometimes I I know the explanation. I just don't know how we're going to get to it. Uh, I don't know any event outside of the opening scene and what explains it. But then there are novels I have no clue uh, where they're going. Uh, And there was one of these, Life Expectancy. It's one of my personal favorites of my own things. And the premise at the beginning was a man is sitting in an expectant father's lounge. His father, his wife is about to give birth to the character is going to be the lead of our novel. And after that scene on that night, we're going to jump forward 20 some years. Uh, And he's in the expectant father's lounge. But at the same time, his own father is at the other end of the hospital dying from a stroke. And he's going back and forth between life and death. Mm. And in the expectant father's lounge with him is one other father, two or three in the morning, waiting for his wife to give birth. And I didn't know who that character was going to be, except that I knew he's the nemesis throughout this novel. And I was writing it, and I started to write about this chain-smoking man, and I wrote the chain-smoking clown. And I had no idea that word clown was going to come out of it. And I stopped looking at it, and I thought, no, you can't do this. This guy can't be clown. It's too absurd. I thought about it a little, and I thought, well, he's like an Emmett Kelly clown. He's not got big red shoes and you know, all the rest of it. He's in a shabby suit, and he's got the makeup on. But, and there's a circus in town. Uh, and I thought, okay, remember how it's worked out before when you let the characters be who they want to be. And as it turned out, if that guy hadn't been a clown, that would not have been the same novel, and it would have been much less of a novel. So it's, it's those kind of moments that uh, I find most mysterious and most exciting. And that novel ended up having a spectacularly wonderful storyline that just kind of evolved on its own. So, but I will agree with you. I am always in every novel at some degree of panic that I'm going to get three hundred pages and not be able to finish this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I get that totally. Do you at least tell me at least that you revise some, that it's not just one and done and it all works out at the end? Revision? I, I revise a great deal, but I don't do it in the traditional way. I have so much self-doubt and always have, and it's never gotten less, that I started doing this many, many years ago. And it, I found it was the only way I could manage self-doubt and get through books without beating myself up too much. I don't go to page two of I revise page one and have the language flowing as best I can possibly make it and to make it as colorful and do all the stuff I want a novel to do in that page. Then I move on to page two when I've got confidence in page one. I can be 10 to 30 drafts. Then I get to page two, the self doubt comes back and I do the same thing. I move one page at a time. At the end of a chapter, I print it out two or three times and pencil it because you see things on a printout you don't see on the screen. And I work my way through the novel. When I get to the end, that's it. It's had many, many graphs, but they've been happening as I flowed through the novel. It's a weird way to work, but I have heard of a couple other people who do it. So. But what about when you have to, you, you like decide, oh, I don't need that chapter. I'm going to make, I'm going to cut that. And you, you've spent like a month on it, revising each page. And <laughs> it, it has never happened to me that way. Uh, what happens is uh, uh, as I'm going, and I'm 
thinking almost subconsciously, you're dwelling on where this is going. Not so much consciously, but you're just revising, revising chapter by chapter. But you know in the back of your head, you're heading toward a problem. It might be 50 pages, 70 pages, I don't know where. But at some point, there is this issue that is being raised that's going to have to be addressed or something that's going to have to be explained about why this character would have done that. Mm-hmm. And what I've discovered by working this way is when I get to that moment, I, I not only had, is it suddenly there for me, but I have two or three options that I've come up with subconsciously. And one of them always works better than the other. Uh, and I think in that way, it prevents me from writing something that I later have to uh, say, well, that was a first good idea. But uh, now that I think about it, I'm going to have to take that chapter out. I've occasionally had where an editor more many years ago than now will say, you don't really need this chapter. And then I will go into defense mode and look at it <laughs> and see, do I need it or do I not? And almost always it's needed. And I can explain why. But once in a great while, part of a scene or part of a chapter, yeah, you can lose a page or two. And then it's just a matter of knitting them together. Mm, well. Wow. Okay, can we talk about publishing for a little bit? Because it's a subject of interest to many. And as you just indicated, you've been in this business for a while and you've seen, well, like five decades of ch- change. Uh, the world, the publishing world looks nothing like it did when you or I started for that matter. Uh, and of course, a few years ago, you very famously made the jump to Thomas and Mercer, meaning Amazon Publishing, easily the most prominent person, author to do that before or since. What prompted the move from the uh, somebody who had been treated pretty well by traditional publishing? Well, um, this may surprise you, but I never in all those years had what I would call a substantial advocate. The only time the books got some more advertising uh, was when I actually put some of my own money up for a couple of titles. I realized that turned out to be stupid because the publisher was still using that money and placing ads where they thought best. Um, I got a little frustrated with a number of things about conventional publishing. And partly it began when they just went about killing the mass market paperback. Right. And I can remember when that started to happen, and I had people in publishing telling me this great thing was going to develop, that the price point on mass markets was just too low, uh, $8 or $10 for premier mass market, uh, just didn't have enough profit return, which I thought was odd since it cost about 30 cents to print a paper back or less when they're printing the boy in those days. And uh, they, I was told again and again that those, we would go out, there was a period when I had a new paperback come out after the hardcover, and we'd sell 2 million or more in the first year of that paper. And I was told, those people are going to move to, we're going to move them to the trade paperback, which costs to the $16, $17. I thought, that isn't going to happen, because people just can't afford that. And this great training ground of the mass market paperback was more than a training ground. It was a place where an audience could be built because you could reach out to all economic groups. So true. Yeah. And that this was going to go away and that the, the ebook was not going to fully replace it because all those mass markets, which used to be in supermarkets and drugstores and, and Target, Walmart, large displays, they were incredibly great little advertising posters. Those covers cr- promoted uh, impulse buying. And if somebody bought you on an impulse and liked it, they'd start coming back. And then they would move up to hard covers and uh, some of them. And, uh, and I was really alarmed at this. And it turned out I was right that trade paperbacks never took up all the slack, neither did the books. And the industry began to shrink. Right. Uh, because it shot itself in the foot. Uh, we went from 500 distributors of paperbacks to five 
uh, over a period of time. And uh, I watched this and I just got frustrated with that and a number of things. And then uh, before I made that, the Amazon original stories, which is an interesting, uh, they publish short stories, novelettes, novellas. And I had done one for them at their request and it did well. And they came back to my agents and said, we want Jane to write a series of six novelettes with the same character uh, for Amazon original stories. And we don't want to pay royalties. And I said to my agents, well, how is that going to work? And he said, well, I want to give this away, Amazon Prime, to Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. uh, but they'll pay you what you make for a novel. And I thought, well, I can hardly argue with that. Yeah. Uh, and I wrote the first six in a series called Nameless. Uh, they, they had three million downloads of this, uh, that series. And wanted, uh, wanted me to do it again. And, uh, so I was, it was around that time, if my clock is right, that I was looking at my situation with publishers and, and looking at the publishing business. And I thought, I don't know they're going to set the ship right for a long time. And I only have so many more years in this career because uh, I don't expect to be writing at 100, though I wouldn't mind. You're still writing at 100. Uh, and uh, here I am at 77, and I'm still doing it. Uh, so I, looked, I said to my agents, I think I have to go a different path. And I think that's going to evolve, although I like people I was working with at Random House. That system had gotten huge. It, Berlin is an enormous empire. And I just didn't like the way it was all working for me. I still opened two books. So I said, I want to pay them back and go on the market. And it was my agents who said, we need to put Thomas and Mercer in that mix uh, of who we go out to. And I said, well, that Amazon's all well for novels and novelettes, but I'm not so sure about novels. I mean, first of all, we're not going to be in bestsellers anymore because they don't count Amazon sales. Uh, and 60% of all books are sold through Amazon. But, you know, there's this animosity toward Amazon in general. Uh, so, but I trust my agents. I was an agent for 14 years. And I got new, like, new agents finally about, about five years ago, I guess. And, uh, and I really liked them. And I said, uh, well, you've been great. I trust you. Let's go with it. And we ended up with eight authors, seven from traditional publishers, one from Amazon. All authors were supposed to come with a marketing plan. A couple of them didn't. Uh, the others that came with a marketing plan mounted to a page or two. Amazon's came with 30 or 40 pages. Wow. And, uh, I read through it and I thought, this is totally different. Uh, and I looked at it and thought, it's all in the end about reaching as many readers as you could get. Uh, this sounds self-serving, but really I, I could, if it was for money, I could just stop doing it a long time ago, but it's out of love of doing it. It's for the reaction you get from readers and the legacy you want to leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I th when I looked at that from Amazon, uh, from Thomas and Mercer, in particular, I thought, all right, you're complaining about the way general publishing is working these days. Put your, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, give this a try. I've got to say it's worked brilliantly. Uh, Thomas and Mercer makes beautiful books. They're well bound. They did decorative end paper, stuff that publishers stopped doing a few years ago. Uh, and, uh, we're doing just fine. I'm doing better financially than I would have done under any of the other contracts. Although I had equal upfront money uh, from different other offers, uh, there were there's just this extra benefit of Amazon about the reach they have uh, on the eBooks, and they do beautiful hardcovers, beautiful trade paperbacks. Some independent stores will carry them; others won't. As yet, some chains don't want to carry them. But in the end, everything has worked out perfectly fine. The interesting upside is I don't think I ever worked with a publisher out of New York who was younger than 
50, uh, <clears throat> and sometimes 60 and up. And suddenly when I went to Thomas and Mercer, I'm working with people who are in their 30s, even in their 20s in some positions. And there is this different attitude. There's this idea we can do anything. We're ready to go. We're enthusiastic. And the efficiency level is very high. So for now, at least, you know, we'll wrap on wood. We both know how everything changes. Uh, it's been one of the best decisions ever. But here's the most important question, Dean. Have they gotten you on TikTok? Because that's where the books live now, right? <laughs> and, it's, you know, and it sounds they, like they're young enough. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they exploit all kinds of uh, uh, venues that I wasn't being in before. And I don't know about TikTok. I don't think I've been in TikTok. Yeah. Well, uh, so uh, I don't dance well, first of all. Oh, well, there, there you go. Forget it then. Um, if, if, if you, uh, I'm hesitating because you started this by uh, advising people to not listen to advice, but now I'm going to ask you to offer some advice <laughs> in regard to publishing since you've done it about every way there is possible to do it. And I know, uh, you know, to me, the fact that there are more options today is a good thing for authors, but it also complicates it for people, particularly when they're just starting out. What advice do you have to authors when they're, you know, trying to figure out how to get published? Well, now, remember when I said don't listen to common wisdom, that's a different kind of advice. Uh, that, that's often just uh, coming to you from people who just have always done it that way and they don't know or see any other way to publish a book. Um, but uh, I, one key thing I think is, uh, I've seen this happen very often, that uh, uh, young writers will look around, they'll scope the market, so to speak. They'll look at what's popular and that's what they're gonna write uh, because they think it's an easier path for selling. Uh, and anytime we get a rage, uh, like the zombie novel rage that went on for a decade, uh, I just saw more and more young writers with promise uh, deciding, ah, I'm going to write a zombie novel. And I would say to them, you know, if you really love zombie novels, if it's your favorite sort of thing, then okay. But if it isn't in your, it's not what your passion is, don't do it. Because the first thing that will happen is a lot of publishers will see your three zombie novels and that's all they want you to write, is zombie novels. Uh, you don't want to type yourself until you know what you really want to write. Uh, so it's, it's really, the best thing you can do is do what you feel you want to do. And if even if there's nothing out there quite like it or anything at all like it, even that might be a good thing because that gives you something unique that you're selling and they may resist the heck out of it. But I often think of Tom Clancy. Nobody was writing a novel like that until right. he wrote The Hunt for Red October. And he not he created his own new genre. Uh, and that's the best it gets. So you have to have some confidence that what your passion is could be possibly shared by others. Yeah, good advice. All right, one last question. What's next for you after this book, after the big dark, dark sky, what should we be looking for? I've got a novel coming in January called The House at the End of the World that I really like. And then I deliver one called After Death. And uh, I'm working on another one now. So uh, hopefully uh, there'll be quite a stream of them coming. I, uh, I, I, you know, I don't have a life, Bill. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you've got a dog, right? I do have a dog. And a wife and no a wife. beautiful house. I remember you talking about that. So, the, the, but, but you also obviously write a bunch, right? Yeah. And that's why you are where you are. Thank you so much for being on this podcast. I really appreciate it. Well, it was great. I enjoyed it, but I wish I could have heard you play the piano again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. You remember you said that because okay. we do a conference every year in Oklahoma City and 
uh, I, I suspect you have things on your schedule, but you're going to get invited next year. Right? <laughs> and if you come, I'll play the piano. <laughs> okay. That's a deal. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Take care. Forgive me for mentioning this, but while we were on a hiatus, I had a new book come out. It's called Plot Counterplot. It's a standalone thriller. And if the reviewers can believe it, may be the best thing I've written in years. Here's the deal. A thriller writer is captured by what appears to be some kind of evil group who wants to use his ingenious plotting skills to help them steal a weapon that we don't want them to have. So if you got some time this weekend, check it out. And of course, as you've already heard Renee and I both mention, WriterCon is coming up. We have authors, agents, editors, book marketers. Renee, what am I not thinking of? What else? Authors, agents, book marketers, uh, bloggers, <laughs> podcasters. Uh, yeah, I yeah, mean, we have PR, a lot. Poets. Publishers. Um, edit publishers, yeah, you said agents. editors. <laughs> say it all. I don't know. But we, if, I mean, we have it. We have it. If you, yeah, we have it. Get the connections and the knowledge you need to build your writing career. And the website again is writercon.com. All right. Until next time, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time. <laughs>